You guys can go ahead and have a seat. <laughs> we got to move the plants because I might kick them. We're two weeks away from Christmas. Are you guys excited a little bit? Like, are, you, are you getting ready, like more ready than you were last week? Is anybody more ready than you were last week for Christmas? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Maybe you're waiting for next week or like the week after to be ready, right? That's kind of where I'm at. People are getting excited. Are your kids excited? You got kids? Who's got excited children? Anybody? Yeah. Daddy, why you don't get presents for us yet? Dude, it's, Christmas is a long time away, man. It's two weeks. It's a lot of time. How many of you started your Christmas traditions? Anybody? Tr- tr- Christmas traditions? All right. I'm not sure that there's any other holiday that has more traditions than Christmas. Just a few weeks ago, I talked about Thanksgiving tradi- traditions. But cr- Christmas has a ton of traditions, and some of them are really, 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 really old. Like the Christmas tree has been around for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And stockings, you know stockings is like a really old tradition. I was reading this book the other day about Christmas traditions, and the stocking thing is super, super old. And in the early colonial days, the colonial people in America would put candy and oranges inside the stockings. Oranges, to me, it just sounds like a really terrible idea. Anybody see that movie, Full Metal Jacket? It's okay. It's, I know it's church, but everyone's seen the Full Metal Jacket. And there's that, that scene where they put the bars of soap and the pillowcases and they like beat that guy with it. Well, in my house, if you put oranges in some stockings, it's going to be like Full Metal Christmas because kids are going to be beating each other in the head with oranges, making bruises and orange juice all at one time. You think I'm kidding? I'm not kidding. It's my children. Some traditions, some traditions are old. Maybe you have some old traditions that you celebrate. What's, what's some other older traditions that you guys have? Baking? Okay, yeah, that's an old tradition. Leaving cookies out for Santa, that's good. Anything else? What's that? Decorating? That's good, uh-huh. They've got the advent calendar, right? Anybody do that? The calendar thing? Christmas elf? Yeah, okay, now, now we're going to talk about that in a second. But we have the older ones. What's that? Opening one, Opening one present. That's good. That's good. My wife just said mistletoe. Look, I'm trying to preach. She's thinking about kissing me already. I can't. Come on now. Mistletoe. Now, what, what's cool about Christmas is that there is... <laughs> Now she's looking at me like she wants to kill me. But the cool thing about Christmas is there's old traditions and new traditions. New traditions like would you, the elf on the shelf, right? And then we have some other new traditions. Like what's another new tradition that we might have? How about the ugly sweater? Anybody done an ugly sweater thing? Now next week at Altar Church is Ugly Sweater Sunday. So make sure you bring your ugly sweater. Now a little warning about that. Don't compliment someone on their ugly sweater unless you're sure it's a Christmas sweater because maybe you're just insulting their outfit that they really like. <laughs> There's also the white elephant gift exchange. Anybody done a white elephant gift exchange before? Okay. All right. I, I love the, the white elephant gift exchange. It's the perfect place for the odd, offensive, or inappropriate Christmas present. I'd like for some of you to tell me about the gifts you've received from the white elephant, but you people are twisted have major issues, so I don't even want to know what you've been given in the white elephant. Yes, I do. Text me later. (laughs) Now, there's other Christmas traditions that we can count on, and some of these are a little bit newer, maybe like the last decade or so, and it's the blockbuster movie, right? We can expect every year around the holiday season for these big budget blockbuster movies to come out, like the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit movies. Anybody get into the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit? You really liked it? I, I loved it. Read the books. Le- read the books. I really got into that. All those movies were released during the Christmas season. Any, any Harry Potter fans? Harry Potter? Oh, we love Harry Potter. He's so cute. Love it. Harry Potter. Almost all the Harry Potter movies were released during the build-up to the holiday season. Does anybody else know of another popular movie franchise that's just begun releasing movies in December? Star Wars! Now, now how many people, that was like from heaven. I'm not sure how that happened. 
Lord, you are mysterious and good. I don't... How many people plan on going to see the Star Wars movie? Anybody? All right, all right, good. You guys loving Star Wars? How many people would consider themselves a fan of the Star Wars franchise? Fans, okay. All right, how many people have no idea about Star Wars at all? Like, have no idea? That's okay. That's how we love everybody here. Everybody, a church for everybody. A church for everybody. Now, I know we have a couple really, really big, huge Star Wars fans in this church. Our creative director slash Sunday media operator man, Jared Bush, is a huge Star Wars fan. Jared, I want you to come up here, Jared. Come on, come on, Jared. Come on up. Now, Jared, in all the time I've known you, like, I've never had you come up on stage, have I? Hi, <laughs> right, bro. Oh, where are you going? <laughs> I got no, I mean, all right, I, okay. all right. so, I, I don't have a degree so in this, what I, So what I want you to know is that, like, I want to ask you is, like, what, tell just a, a little bit about Star Wars. Like, in one sentence, what is Star Wars? Star Wars is the most epic music or epic movie in the galaxy and movie in the galaxy. In the galaxy. <laughs> in the galaxy. How many movies are there? Uh, there are close to well, after this coming one will be like nine. Okay. And, and like, what's your favorite movie? Uh, episode five. Episode it's five. My Why? Yeah. Um, because it's the best one. Just okay, it's the best <laughs> one, right? Yeah. Right. And so, would it be like? Do you think someone could just go to episode five and then know everything about Star Wars, or they have to like see the whole, the whole thing? Gotta see the whole thing. Gotta see the whole thing. All right, all right. Now, one, one final question: Who shot first, Greedo or Han Solo? Han Solo. Okay. Shot first. Thank you. Good. Give it up for Jared. Good job, Jared. You can put that. Thanks, Jared. Appreciate that very, very much. So, if we're gonna go see Star Wars on December what? Fifteenth. <laughs> What's your favorite Bible verse? Mm-hmm. All right, if you're going to see Dece Star Wars December 15th, it's probably best that you have a proper understanding of the prior episodes. Anybody seen all Star Wars movies? All right, so you can probably just jump right in and understand what's going on. And if you know everything that's happening, if you've seen all the episodes, you can probably enjoy the story more. The same is true for The Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, Harry Potter, and also the Christmas story. I think we, when we tell the Christmas story, we focus on one sliver of the narrative and try to assign meaning to the Christmas story without understanding the story in the larger context. This is why I said last week that we tend to sell the story of Christmas sort of short. We accentuate some parts of the story while muting other parts and like we talked about last week, we get what wrong? The mix. We get the mix wrong, right? We get the mix wrong. So Christmas is part of this grand narrative in the Bible where everything is connected and intermingled and codependent. And one piece, one episode, relates to all the others. This is why we can't really understand the meaning or the importance of one episode— unless we have a basic understanding of the rest. Just like every great story, just like Star Wars, The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, everything has its place. And we can't understand the full meaning or impact of one part or episode without understanding the others. Right? Yes. So if you really wanted to understand what the Bible has to say about Christmas and what it means for us, we probably want to break it down into four episodes. Episode one, we call foundations. Episode two, we'd call foreshadowing. Episode three, we'd call fulfillment. And episode four, we'd call future. Now, we talked about the first actor episodes, episode foundations last week. The episode starts on the very first page of your Bible where heaven and earth are one. God has created us in his image to reign and to rule. We were created to embody the rule of God, royal farmers. Remember that? We were tasked with having dominion and subdue creation. We were created to reign and to rule. 
We're given the assignment to use our wisdom and creativity and passion to create a thriving civilization of other image bearers. And so you see this directive and human beings actually doing this on the very first page of your Bible. But we also see them doing it on the very last page of our Bibles. So why, if we were created to rule and to reign and subdue, subdue and to create a civilization of image bearers reflect, reflecting the image of God, why are we currently in a state where people die and tragedy happens and there's heartbreak? Why is that happening? Well, back in Genesis 3, we chose to reject God and create a kingdom of our own design. Because of our choice, there's a division or separation between, between heaven and earth, and Jesus came to establish, or rather reestablish, that kingdom and restore us back to God's image, giving us an opportunity to rule and to reign again. And so in him, we are living in this new space where heaven and earth collide. And currently, our task is to try to create that kingdom here on earth and live the principles of that kingdom, which primarily involves actively living out sacrificial love to others, recreating that kingdom that, that was intended for us and bringing love to reign and to rule on behalf of God, ruling in his stead, embodying his rule through our acts of love. So episode one is that grand overview. In episode two, that's where we get into the moving parts of how all this happens. Episode two, we learn about foreshadowing. Foreshadowing is seeing glimpses of the things to come because from the moment of that rebellion or division way back in Genesis 3, from that moment where we chose to create a kingdom of our own rather than follow God's intended purpose for us, God has been pursuing us. God has been chasing us. He's been seeking to restore us. He's been laying out a path for us to follow and leaving hints through the Bible on how and, th and how and through he's going to use, how he's going to do it, and who he's going to use to bring us back to him. In the third episode, fulfillment, we learn that everything that was foreshadowed in ep episode two is coming to pass. All the things that were promised are fulfilled and revealed. We see exactly how God's pursuit of us has unfolded, and we, see, we receive specific instructions for how we are res to respond to it, which, re which leads us in to the fourth episode, future. In episode four, all the pieces come together. We understand foreshadowing and fulfillment in the context of foundation. It informs us how we should live and believe and behave and interact in episode four, in the future. In other words, as we look at the narrative of the scriptures, we can see exactly where things went wrong. We can see exactly how God promised to fix them, and we can see exactly how his promises have come to pass and what we should do as a response to the promises becoming reality. So all the episodes are connected, right? You get it? We can't just, we can't just look at one episode and understand the grand narrative. One isn't more important than the other. You can't have Return of the Jedi without the Empire Strikes Back. You can't have the Goblet of Fire without the Prisoner of Azkaban, right? You can't have Return of the King without Fellowship of the Ring. I'm sure you said that back there, I just didn't hear it. And you can't have fulfillment before you have foreshadowing. And you don't want either of those without future. So today, as we prepare for Christmas Day, we're going to discuss one of the coolest parts, truly, of the Bible. Foreshadowing of the coming king. Open your Bibles to Luke chapter 4. If you have the Bible app, you'll see that there. In the Bible app, search events, and you'll find Altar Church. If you have um, Luke 4 memorized, that's fantastic. You will win free tickets to Star Wars, probably, somewhere in some church. And if you just choose to sit there without a Bible or a Bible app or without memorizing, you can just read on the screen. Now, as you open Luke chapter 4 and go to verse 14, you're going to notice that Jesus is a full-grown man. This 
passage isn't talking about baby Jesus, and maybe you're a little disappointed because this sermon series is about Christmas. And last week I talked about Genesis and Revelation, and I'm reading from, from Luke now, Luke chapter 4, and Jesus is a man, and you came to read about baby Jesus, and I'm talking about 30-year-old Jesus. Trust me, we're going to get there, okay? We're, we're going to get to baby Jesus. I'm going to spend two full weeks on baby Jesus. But today we have to talk about foreshadowing before we talk about fulfillment. But we're going to get there, okay? You trust me? Are you with me? Okay. So as we read Luke chapter 4, in the context of where Jesus is at, he's just been baptized, baptized by his cousin. Then he heads out into the wilderness for a time of fasting and prayer where he faces a great deal of temptation and difficulty. But now he's a, he has emerged to start his public ministry. And so starting in verse 14, it says, Then Jesus returned to Galilee, filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Reports about him spread quickly throughout the whole region. He taught regularly in their synagogue. Synagogues were ch was church. So when I say synagogue, I want you to hear church. And was praised by everyone. So Jesus was just beginning his ministry by going into churches and reading and then teaching. And he's gaining a following. Je Jesus is sort of like a, a, a traveling preacher. He's like the famous preacher of the day. And he's not doing any miracles. He's not confronting any religious leaders. He's pretty, pretty low-key. And he's getting a big following. So Jesus goes to his boyhood home of Nazareth. And it says he went as usual to the synagogue. And what does synagogue mean? Church. On the Sabbath. And he stood up to read the scriptures. He read the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. It was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written. So this young man, Jesus, and I'm going to call him young because I'm like, I think I'm 38. I don't know. I might be 37. I'm not sure. Someone do the math for me. September 21st, 1980. So I'm 37 or 38. Jesus is 30. He's a young man, okay? He's a young man. He goes into this church where he grew up. He probably attended services there hundreds of times. So he would have known everyone in attendance. Some of the elder gentlemen there, he would have known since he was a boy. Some of the 30-year-olds, he would have grown up with them. They may have been his friend. So he gets up in front of everyone in the congregation. He goes forward to read the scriptures, kind of like Jared came forward. There's probably no Star Wars music when Jesus came forward. Jesus comes forward, and there's this attendant. And when I say attendant, I want you to think altar boy. And this attendant or altar boy goes in the back, and he goes into this thing that sort of looks like a big fancy china cabinet called an ark. And he takes this thing out. It's a scroll, and it's like two rolling pins, and you open it up. You read it this way horizontally, and you would read from right to left. And he hands this thing to Jesus. And Jesus reads from Isaiah chapter 61. And what he's reading from, the book of Isaiah, is what we would call the Old Testament. Old Testament. The Hebrews would call it the Tanakh. So he's reading from sacred scriptures. Everything that we, we would read in the Old Testament, they were reading in scrolls. And he opens up to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim the captives that will be released, and the blind will see. The oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. And so Jesus rolled up the scroll, handed it back the, to the attendant, and then he sits down. Jesus was reading a passage that was written 700 years before his birth by a man named Isaiah. And he was reading about a person that would come to proclaim good news. And when we read the words good news in that Old Testament, it's often associated with a royal dec decree or an announcement of a new king. So the good news was that there was a king who was coming to do what? To release people from the chains of oppression and to give people sight. To give people sight is to be understood as something miraculous, but also to be enlightening to people to truth, to give people insight into God. So this king would come and bring in an era of forgiveness and enlightenment and understanding and peace and restoration back to God, everything that was lost in Genesis chapter 3. So Jesus, the son of a carpenter, the traveling preacher, reads this text, and then he sits down, legs crossed, 
in front of all these men who he had known since he was a child. And when the reader would sit down, when someone would go to read at church and they'd sit down, they'd be expected to give a summary of the passage. So there's this expectation in the room for Jesus to speak. They want to hear from this young teacher. They want to hear from this man who's gained a following. They want to hear from Joseph's son. They want to hear from this Jesus who they've known from a boy. It says, all eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. Then he began to speak to them. The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. Now what Jesus was saying is that he was the person that was written about in the book of Isaiah 700 years prior. Jesus was saying that he was the one that would come and restore people back to God. Jesus was saying that he was the new king, that he was the healer, that he was the, the, the restorer, that he was the sight giver, that he was the chain breaker, and that he had arrived. And the people that heard this became very upset. How can this guy, this man that we've known since he was a boy, Joseph's kid, the carpenter's kid, that family has nothing. He doesn't have any education. We know this guy. How can he claim to be all these things? How can the young man sitting before us have the nerve to make all these statements about himself? And so you notice how the attitude about Jesus has shifted from chapter 4, verse 14, when he was highly esteemed and praised. Everyone loved Jesus, a traveling preacher. But in verse 28, it says they want to kill him. When they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious. Jumping up, they mobbed him and forced him to the edge of the hill on which the town was built. And they intended to push him over the cliff. Why do their opinions of Jesus change so quickly? How did they get to this place of anger? Maybe they thought Jesus was being pretentious. Maybe they thought that Jesus was being arrogant. But is that enough to make you want to kill someone? Is that enough to make you so angry that you want to push someone off a cliff? The reason they were angry is because they knew about foreshadowing. They knew that the new king, the healer, the restorer, the sight giver, the chain breaker was a central part of the scriptures. All those scrolls that they had, all those scrolls that they read, the dozens of scrolls that they had been reading since childhood, the scrolls that they had committed to memory, from first to last, all spoke of the new king, the healer, the restorer, the sight giver, the chain breaker that was to come. He was the hope of their salvation. And they had been waiting all of their lives, and so had their parents, and so had their parents, and so had their parents before. For thousands of years, they had been waiting for the one who would come back to fix all the things that had gone wrong. And they had seen the foreshadowing in Genesis and Exodus and Numbers and Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Joshua judges Ruth. 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, all the prophets, all the poetry, they saw the foreshadowing. And now they were waiting for fulfillment. And so all the men in the synagogue that day, they would have known their scriptures well. And they would have known that story, a foundation that we talked about, that they were created to rule, but our choice caused a fraction in the relationship between God and man, a fracture between heaven and earth. And they would have known that God wanted to send a new king, a healer, a restorer, a sight giver, a chain breaker, and that this was God's plan from the beginning. Even in the moments of our rebellion, God was planning to pursue us. He was planning to pursue them. The people in the synagogue that day would have known 
that there was foreshadowing even in that first book of Genesis all the way back in the beginning. They would have known the very family that this king would come from and that he would have an everlasting reign. In Genesis 49, the scepter will not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from his descendants until the coming of the one to whom it belongs, the one whom all nations forever and ever and ever will honor. The people in the synagogue, they didn't even have, have known the, the city where this new king would be born. But you, O Bethlehem, only a small village among the people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel whose origins are in the distant past, meaning eternal, will come to you on my behalf. And these people in the synagogue would have known that Jesus would rule in peace and justice and that he'd be exceptionally wise and uncommonly compassionate and committed to peace. For to us a child is born, a son is given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And his government and its peace will never end. And they would have known that the great king, the coming king, would be a descendant of the great king David. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. And the men of, of the synagogue, the men who read those scrolls, would also have known that the coming king would have been born of a virgin. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Look! The virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and we will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And they knew that there would be three traveling kings who would find him and bow down. And they knew that, that his family would flee to Egypt at his birth. And they knew if they read those scrolls that he would suffer as an adult. The scriptures that these men had read that were written hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus said that, that this new king would come and he'd be a healer and a restorer and a sight giver and a chain breaker. But his friends would also abandon him. And he'd be betrayed by 30 pieces of silver. And he'd be oppressed and afflicted. He'd be mocked and insulted. And he'd be pierced in his hands and his feet. And his clothing would be divided. And he'd be killed next to criminals and buried in a rich man's tomb. And then on the cross, he'd cry out, Father, why have you forsaken me? And yet he'd forgive the people who were hurting him, saying, Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They knew all of this. Because it was written and available to them in the scriptures that they read every Sabbath the scriptures that they memorized and recited to their children. Scrolls that they had read that foreshadowed a time of fulfillment. So why didn't they recognize fulfillment when it walked into church, read from a scroll, and said, here I am? You see, they were expecting a son of David from the tribe of Judah. They were expecting a man born of a virgin from the town of Bethlehem, a teacher, a healer, a prophet. And yet he sits in front of them unrecognized. And now they want to kill him. Why don't they see him? And the thing about foreshadowing <laughs> is it's always much clearer in hindsight. Anybody ever watch a movie that didn't really make sense until you got to the end of it? Right? Yeah, everybody? Mm. You're trying to guess who done it. You didn't quite figure it out until the very, 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 very end. When Andrea and I watch a movie together, I swear every character, she says, she's bad. He's bad. I know that guy's bad. He's, he's a bad guy. He's the one who did it. Like every single character. And so at the end, when she, when she, on the occasion that she's right, she's like, I told you he was bad. I told you she was bad. She did it. I knew it. 
but she doesn't always get it right. We don't always get it right. And sometimes our desires impact our interpretation of the clues. Remember that back in the day when you thought that girl liked you, but she didn't? And you were just convinced that she smiled at you in a way that was different than she smiled at anybody else. And just because she said hi to you that one time, she was madly in love with you. And so you wrote her a note, and it said, will you go out with me? Check yes or no. I remember it well. It was third grade. Her name was Kelly Stuber, and she checked no. So I was devastated. I went home, I ate some Pop, pop Rocks, and watched Saved by the Bell on Marathon. And if you're watching at home, Kelly Stuber, don't be messaging me. I found a woman who checked yes. <laughs> but sometimes we get the clues wrong. Sometimes we miss the foreshadowing. Sometimes we misread the foreshadowing. And that's what happened with those men in the synagogue and so many other people who should have known so many other people who should have seen that Jesus was all over the pages of those scrolls. And they misread the clues because of their own expectations. These people were under Roman authority, and before that, it was extreme oppression from the Greeks for 400 years. So for them, the new king, the healer, the restorer, the sight giver, the chain breaker, was also a conqueror who would destroy their enemies. And the healing, restoring, sight giving, and chain breaking was only for them. They expected God's deliverer to arrive on a mission of conquest. So that young man who came as a carpenter's son, they knew that he wasn't the new king because he wasn't a conqueror. They knew that Joseph's son was teaching about love and compassion, and so he wasn't going to overthrow the Roman Empire. And because of their expectations and fears, they misread the foreshadowing. They misread the foreshadowing and missed fulfillment sitting right in front of them. And Jesus wasn't what they had expected. He had poor parents, poor family. We don't know, but Joseph probably wasn't even alive at this point. He was born in a shed with farm animals. The bed that he laid in was a feeding trough. He wasn't well educated, he wasn't highly esteemed. But he was exactly what God wanted to use to usher in the upside-down kingdom. A kingdom where love reigns, peace prevails, unity and humility are esteemed, where enemies are conquered through enduring love, where evil is destroyed through charity, where we rule by serving one another. So the importance of foreshadowing in this grand story of Christmas is understanding God's intentions to bring us back to him and bring heaven back to us. And this was always his plan. And we learn something about God in this that his pursuit of us is relentless and passionate. He doesn't give up. He is steadfast. He is creative. Who would have thought that the king would return in a manger? That his parents would be poor? That he'd be preaching love and giving things away? That power is achieved by stooping low, by acting as a slave to wash one another's feet? Who would have thought? God is surprising, and he's relentless. 
but his pursuit of us will always involve a disruption of our expectations. I promise you that, a disruption of our expectations. What God offers is never disappointing, but he will almost always disappoint our expectations. He'll always, always disappoint what we think we need in order to get, for him to get to us where he wants us to go. Because our expectations are nearly always singularly focused on us. My expectations of God are almost always singularly focused on me. They're focused on the things that I think I need to make me happy or to satisfy me. So I write this into God's plans for me. I write, I write, I write him into my demands. I'll say things like, God, if you love me, the illness will go away. God, if you love me, I'll find a relationship. God, if you love me, I'll have health. If you love me, God, I'll get a good job or I won't be depressed. The foreshadowing doesn't lead us there. The clues don't lead us there. But that's where we drive the story. We are talking about a God who breathed creation into existence. A God who's come down and can take all of our transgressions away. But we get so busy focusing on our stuff and our demands and sitting inside of our own comfort that we miss the fulfillment. We miss all the grand things that God has in store for all of us, for his church. Does God care about our needs and desires? Of course he does. Of course he does. Jesus says to, to come to me with anything you desire, the desires of your heart. Knock and it shall be open. None of our needs or cares or concerns are too small. But is meeting our needs the singular aim of God? Of course not. Of course not. And what God knows is that meeting our needs is, something, is sometimes only possible when we stop focusing on our needs and begin meeting the needs of others. And if we don't get to that spot, if we don't get to that spot where we can see that we can be changed by loving other people, by meeting the needs of other people, by getting rid of our expectations so we can submit ourselves to God, we become like those men sitting in church staring fulfillment in the face and missing it. And we'll miss where God wants to take us. We'll miss what God has in store for the church. We'll miss the grand design of everything that God has put in our paths. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. If this is how Jesus identifies himself and we are his followers, let's hinge our identity on those words. Let's stand up and pray together. Father, we know that you are in our presence, that you've brought us here today to worship you. That is our, our task and great honor to serve you. And I want to pray for the church. I want to play, pray a blessing and a challenge over this church. But first, Father, I want to pray to the one or two or 10 or 20 who are here today and have no understanding of how deeply and personally you love them, God. That you love them more than the weight of their mistakes. That if they're here, it's not by accident. It's because you have pursued them. And so if that's you, you could be standing here in this moment, hearing the true truth of God's deep compassion for you, 
that God wants to provide you healing and restoration, what I want you to know in this moment is all you have to do is say yes. In this moment, this could be a new day, a new you, a new creation, and all you have to do is say yes. Jesus says, we are in your presence. I want you to speak to that one or two or 10 or 20 and let them know that today is a new day. God, it's just you and them. It's just you and them. There's no one to the right. There's no one to their left. It's just you and them and you're speaking into their hearts and they're saying, what next, God? What next? And if that's you, I just want you to, to take this moment an act of courage, an act of boldness, and just raise your hand. Just raise your hand, knowing that today is a new day, knowing that Christ is the Lord of your life, knowing that all things change and all things become new in him. And for the church, church, do you want to be a church? that helps free people from addiction. A church that proclaims good news, that a king has come and making everything new again. If you want to be that church, I want you to raise your hands. Do you want to be a church that is binding broken hearts and providing hope for the hurting? Put your hands up. Do you want to be a church that helps lost people find faith? Let leads hopeless people to joy in the name of Jesus Christ. Do you want to be that church? Put your hands up. Now I want you to keep your hands in the air. If you are willing to endure love that is difficult so that other people can find hope. And I want you to keep your hands up and only if you are willing to set aside your own expectations and demands so that God can work through your life. And I want you to keep your hands up, but only if you know that in Christ Jesus, you've been called to serve in an upside down kingdom where love reigns and peace prevails and unity and humility are highly esteemed where enemies are conquered through love and hearts are healed through charity. Jesus, this is your church. Our hands are in the air. Use us how you will. Disrupt our expectations. Motivate us to move. Encourage us to change because you are healer. You are restorer. You are sight giver. You are chain breaker. And we are your church. Church, give them a shout of praise. Keep your hands in the air and let's worship together.